rise. The Court of Appeals Division 1 is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning, all. We are here for oral argument in IC 23-0002, Craig v. City of Phoenix. These proceedings are being video and audio recorded and live streamed. So, counsel, we ask that you please identify yourself and your client at the beginning of your argument. Each side will have 20 minutes for argument, and appellant's counsel is responsible to watch the clock if you'd like to reserve a portion for rebuttal. Also, please keep in mind that we've read the briefs and have conferenced the case this morning. And with that, counsel, you may proceed. May it please the Court, my name is David Abney. I'm here representing the petitioner. I had some surgeries recently, and they gave me some pain pills. I kept a couple. I'm tempted to take one before oral argument. That way I won't remember what happened, and I'll have a good time. It'll all be a great experience. But I didn't have any today, so I'll be with us. I'm not sure these cases come up very often. I noticed that the number for this case was 0002 or something like that. And I understand why, after getting into it. I haven't handled very many of these appeals, but the standard seems to be a very, very tough one, which, as I researched this more and more, I wondered why it was so hard, because back in 1934, the Arizona Supreme Court said that when you're trying to determine whether evidence supports an award of this nature, you must construe the facts as strongly as is reasonably possible in favor of the worker. That seems to have been sort of pushed to the side over the decades, and I'd like to get back, as they say, back to first principles here, because that's important. Is that directive to the administrative law judge or to us? I think it's directed to you. Well, why would it be directed to us, since we haven't heard any evidence? Well, you are considering the evidence, at least secondhand, the evidence that the administrative law judge considered. It comes through him, and then you look at it, and you have to decide how exactly you're going to construe the evidence that he construed. And I believe, of course, it would apply to the administrative law judge as well, but it certainly applies here. This judge, you, and all the members of the panel in the court, I would hope would look at the evidence in light most strongly favoring the worker. If I'm wrong on that, then I'm wrong. Well, it just seems to me that since the administrative law judge is in the position to consider the evidence presented, I don't disagree with you that they're supposed to use that standard. Oh, good. But at the same time, once they've used that standard, and we presume they do, don't we just review that for an abuse of discretion? I believe there's more that should be going on that is going on in these kinds of appeals, that you should look at it through the filter of, well, was the evidence construed in the light most favorable to the worker? And whatever evidentiary issues are before the court, I believe the evidence would need to be construed in the light most favoring the worker. I think that's a fair enough way to approach these kinds of cases. What's the best sort of recent case for that proposition, recognizing there are many cases recently saying that we're to construe the record in a light most favorable to sustaining the award, which is contrary to what you're describing. Exactly right. And that's, I don't think there's, this has been left back in the dustbin of history, and it really shouldn't be in the dustbin of history. And I understand what you're saying, although we all have taken an oath to follow what our Supreme Court tells us to do, and I believe what the standard I recited comes from them as well as decisions that we've issued. I think it's mostly decisions issued by this court where that new sort of approach has been ratified. Most of them, I agree, because most of these cases sort of end here judicially, but some go upstairs. I'm not sure that I've, I don't recall a decision from the Arizona Supreme Court where they're using that newer standard. This, and the older standard, I believe, which is the correct one, has been lost. And it shouldn't be lost. I found it. The court can find it and follow it. One of the big, the big problem here, one of the big problems here is the, the ALJ's refusal to, a denial problem, I should say, more likely, of the motion and offer of proof concerning what the wife had, had heard from Tom and what his secretary had heard from Tom about the close quarters exposure 
uh, which Tom regarded as exposure to someone who had COVID. He said this man was in his office uh, and was coughing and hacking, and they were together for a period of time and found out that same day that he had tested COVID positive for COVID. And Tom was extremely upset about that with his secretary, uncharacteristically so, extremely upset with his wife about it when he related it to her, extremely, very uncharacteristically so once again. And it could be and should be categorized as an excited utterance, which would mean it would be admissible. It wouldn't be hearsay. But even 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 if that were admissible, isn't it fairly speculative? As far as going to the, it's evidence. Right. And it's evidence of a person in his office coughing and hacking, close quarters, confined space, period of time, and then he says, and he tested positive for COVID. So I learned all that when did he one test time. positive for COVID? The man who was in the office had tested positive for COVID. And that's what before, upset... Before the coughing incident? Or he tested positive later? Yeah, later. And it sounded like the same day from what the, the, the offers of proof. It was that he found out about it. Who found out about it? I mean, that's... Tom found out about it. I'm okay. sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm playing pronoun There's way too many he's in that in the <laughs> too many pronouns. colloquy. To... There was a gentleman in his office, who, Tom's office, who was coughing, hacking, wheezing. And Tom found out later, later that day, apparently, that that gentleman had tested po positive for COVID, which meant he had COVID before testing positive for it. So he, so he had COVID, he knew he had COVID, and he nonetheless went to work and went into Tom's office and coughed and sneezed in, around Tom. Tom, enough. Enough that Tom was extremely worried about it and uh, complained about it to his secretary, complained about it to his wife, and went out and got his own COVID test after that because he was so concerned about, probably, well, no, I'm sorry, he, was, he went out and got a COVID vaccination after that because he was so concerned about it. And he had been anti-vaccine, which of course one of these, yeah, I don't know if this is one of these heartbreaking stories where the vaccine would have saved his life or not, I don't know. But uh, it was it was sufficiently severe episode that he changed his opinion about getting vaccinated and went and, and, went and did it. Based on the, the way I described it, doesn't that seem inherently unreliable? To know that somebody with COVID, knowing they have COVID, nonetheless goes to work, coughs and coughs and coughs and coughs and sneezes and still, the, what was he, a known spreader of the COVID virus? I, that I don't know. But I know people have done this and they, they, who cares? I've got COVID. I don't care if anybody else gets it. I don't think I, don't think I spread it. I don't okay. think COVID it really exists. Remind me not to hang around your friends. All right. Yes. <laughs> well, not necessarily my friends. <laughs> but it was, it's a difficult situation. You still have people denying that, that really COVID is a bad thing and uh, denying that vaccines help and just this whole culture. And I think Tom was probably on the fringes of it that, that I'll be fine. I don't need a vaccination. Everything's fine. It's really not as bad. And he was an unusual person. Uh, he exhibited symptoms, according to his wife, severe, you know, continuing symptoms, hawk, hacking cough, tiredness, fatigue, went on and on. He put up with it. He went, he went into work. Finally, he, he tested positive on the 19th. She started first noticing this on the 10th. The 19th, he tested test positive. And he stays home, self-treating, quarantining, and all that. And the 25th, he passes out. So he goes to the hospital. He's there for a couple of days. He's released. He goes back home. And... He's, he's not over it. He's not better. But he's, he's such a stubborn coot that he just, he's, I'm going to go home. And then he has to go back to the hospital, and then he stays there until he dies. So I, I think he's an unusual person as far as his persistence of symptoms and existence of symptoms and simply living with him and trying to do his job, tough things out, uh, which, did, which, not, which is not a good thing to do, probably never a good thing to do. But the key point here for the administrative law judge is he refused, he denied the offer of proof. So that evidence is not in front of them. The excited evidence, evidence, it's not in the, not, not in the calculation. Counsel, let me ask you, um, you a couple of times have referred to excited utterance, and that is an exception to the rule against hearsay for matters governed by the Arizona Rules of Evidence. These hearings are not. Now, I, I don't know which way that cuts, um, but the, the, the city objected as this evidence being unreliable, given some sort of gaps in names and other things. Um, and again, recognizing I'm not sure which way it cuts, the fact that the rules of evidence don't apply in these. But what's your response, quite apart from excited utterance, Arizona rules of evidence, on, on why that evidence, which was captured in an offer of proof, for sure, um, at least 
at some level why that had to be considered by the ALJ. It is corroborative evidence of an exposure at work, strongly given twice, two separate sources, of course, all going back to Tom, but they, they corroborate what, what was happening there. Uh, the ALJ didn't, didn't talk about unreliability, talked about, well, it's cumulative. She had testified somewhat about this. And my reference was to the city's objection, yeah. not the ALJ's ruling. She, but, but she got cut off, as she was just getting into it at the, at the hearing, by the objections from the city. And so she wasn't able to give the full story that came out in the offer of proof. And that's just her, not talking about the secretary, who, who's, whose testimony comes in through the offer of proof only, as far as I can tell. Uh, but he said uh, uh, it was cumulative, and it's not cumulative. Uh, it just was, it wasn't accepted. He denied the offer of proof, so it's, it can't be cumulative. Uh, it is corroborative, and there's a difference. I know Judge McMurdy is a wordsmith, and you appreciate the difference between cumulative and corroborative. They're not the same sort of thing. It's valuable evidence that, that the ALJ needed to calculate, to, to work through and figure out what to do, and he denied himself. That evidence. Evidence. And then, oh. go, no, go ahead, go ahead. You may be anticipating my I'm question. I'm not. I was shifting gears to something else. No, the, the ALJ said, look, even if it was allowed, it didn't support a factual determination that the unknown individual was COVID positive, right? I mean, that, that's what the ALJ said, I think. I, I, if I'm wrong, I want to know that. And if I'm right, I'd like to know what your response to that is. We say this, he says her testimony, talking about Lynn, is cumulative. Uh, essentially cumulative. Yeah, right? and, essential, and then even if allowed, does not support a factual determination that an individual was COVID positive. Well, why would it not? I mean, if, if he's saying that this person was there with all these COVID symptoms and then he tested positive, that would support a determination. I think he's just, he's rejecting the offers of proof entirely and that colors the rest of his analysis. But then you get into this, well, I'm going to choose whose medical opinion to follow. And Dr. Smith was very strong, very clear, number of factors explaining why he believed that the exposure had taken place in the work environment. Part of it was that they had been very cautious outside of their home and very cautious at home about where they went and what they did. Uh, but at, at work, we've got these, two, these two, two accounts of this exposure, and he said it's more likely than not it's going to be at the work. But we have Dr. Brooks on the other side who in his, his report says, basically, I don't know where he got it. And then when he testified, he was even clear about that. You know, he says, I don't have a dog in the fight. I do this on behalf of the Poison Center. I just look at this as a public health service, and there is no way I can tell you where Mr. Craig got his COVID from. No way I can tell you. So he's taken himself out of the picture. I can't tell you where he got it. Uh, Dr. That's, Smith that's can, really though. not... I, I don't believe that's really a fair assessment because he goes on to say that given the, the chronology of how he manifests and you backtrack that it would have been in a period of time when in fact um, he was not, it was not the unknown man and it was more likely a time when he was at the uh, financial planning. But that completely disregards the testimony from the wife about the symptoms. And there really was no contradiction to that. She, she was in a position to observe him. And she was consistent, says, it's around July 10th that I, st that I started noticing these things. Uh, the tiredness, the, the dry coughing, uh, the gastrointestinal problems. He just wasn't himself. And yet he held on. He kept on working. So uh, Dr. Dr. Brooks is, is trying sort of to nibble at the cake without actually eating it. He's mentioning these things, but his, his ultimate opinion is, I can't tell you where he got it. Now, he can't say where he got it. Well, I'm using pronouns again. Dr. Bruce can't say where Tom got it, but Dr. Smith can. So you really don't have well, a conflict. I, admittedly, he appoints it to the unknown man, the, the, he being the expert for Tom. Yes. But I, I'm, I don't think the expert for the, for the insurance carrier was as as bad as you say, because it seems like he was just saying, I don't know from whom he got it, but I do know that it was during this period of time. Am I wrong on that assessment of what his testimony was? Yes, in a okay. sense. I do not know, well, what he said was literally, there's no way I can tell you where he got his COVID. No way I can tell you. 
but then he then he sort of then he waffles around saying, well, based on the chronology, don't think it that the chronology the wife gives is correct. And that's that's about all he, that, that's about all he can say. That's about all he will I, say. I'm pretty sure I'd ha I'd have to go back and look specifically. But didn't he opine that he he thought it was more probable that he got it at the financial planning seminar or that period? He indicated time. that that was a possible source, a more likely source. I'm not sure he said more likely, but he he definitely I remember oh. definitely being a possible source, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Because the wife relates that the only person coughing at the seminar was Tom. I thought there were other people that, that got COVID at the seminar. Didn't he, the, one of the people they, that attended the seminar also came down with COVID symptoms? Yes, later they did. But there was, no, there, were no, there was no symptomology there from anybody except Tom. She remarked that Tom was the one who was coughing. And the seminar was not the thing that is portrayed uh, by, uh, even by, by Dr. Brooks. He says there's 100 people there. I mean, he has a pretty big number, and it's actually 35 or 40, very spread out. And they did use some COVID protocols, although Tom and his wife were not consistently using the mask at all when they were there at the seminar. Mr. Abney, it's, it's clear to me, at least, that Dr. Smith and Dr. Brooks differed in their perspective. Their testimony conflicted at times. Um, but isn't that what an ALJ is there to try to address and make determinations on the basis of? It, not all these cases come in with all the evidence pointing in one or the other direction. Uh, yes, you're right. But, it, but it, here I think we do have more of ships passing in the night, where one expert is saying, I can't tell you where he got it, and the other expert says, I can positively tell you where he got it. So I'm not sure that that is the kind of conflict that the cases are dealing with. Here we've got more wiggle room. Uh, and Dr. Brooks is, the testimony was aggravating to read because he kept, he kept nibbling away and he kept going in a different direction. Uh, but the reports that he gave were, I can't tell you, the initial report. And then at trial, he said, at the t hearing, he says, uh, I, can't, I can't, there's no way I can tell you. There's no way I can tell you. And then he's making these other oddball statements that don't really tie in to his rejection of the ability to say where, where Tom got it. If I may reserve my minutes here. Great. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Your Honors, may it please the court. My name is David Wundmark, and I represent the respondents, the city of Phoenix. It seems that a fundamental issue here is the significance of the lay testimony. And fundamentally, lay testimony cannot tell you when or how somebody contracts a disease or provide a medical diagnosis. For that, medical uh, evidence is necessary. In this case, both sides presented medical evidence about the likely source of uh, Tom's infection and the ALJ resolved a conflict in that evidence in favor of the opinions of Dr. Brooks and determined that, uh, in all likelihood, um, Mr. Craig, Tom, was, was not infected at work. Uh, the petitioner suggests here and, and in his briefing that there was no conflict in the evidence, that somehow Dr. Brooks just washed his hands of the whole question. But really, this is a, a conflict between Dr. Smith's opinion that the evidence does point to a workplace conf uh, infection and Dr. Brooks' opinion that the evidence does not point to a workplace infection. It's a choice between A and not A, and it's hard for me at least to imagine a clearer example of a direct conflict between experts' opinions. Counsel, let me ask you, the evidence that was, the lay evidence that was not accepted, not allowed by the ALJ, I understand that medical testimony was necessary in this case, as in many cases, but that testimony is based in part on facts provided to experts, correct? Correct, Your Honor. So, and, and given that the rules of evidence don't apply here, wouldn't that suggest a, a broader sense, sort of looking at even hearsay that is at least marginally relevant and recognizing almost anything can be relevant? Um, how, how did the ALJ not err in, in excluding consideration of that evidence? 
I think your question has a couple of different components. It was a long question. You're right, and I apologize. <laughs> One is the significance of lay witness statements to medical professionals sure. to provide a foundation for their reports. Yep. And here, I don't think anybody questions that the doctors did not have a good foundation for their reports. Dr. Smith interviewed Lynn Craig um, out, uh, you know, without even being sworn. He reviewed her deposition transcript uh, that, was, that contained testimony that was then excluded during the hearing, I including her testimony that Tom told her that this unknown man was, it had in fact tested positive for COVID. And so Dr. Smith relied on all this information to form his opinions. And during the hearing, defense counsel uh, objected to that as hearsay, and the presiding judge said, no, no, it's, it's quite common for doctors to rely on hearsay. This is normal for experts in that field. It, it's fine. It's good. So that, but was that allowing the doctor to testify at, at, that that was the base, some of the basis or a basis of his opinion, as opposed to receiving it for the truth of the matter asserted? Those strike me as different things. If I'm following your question, the, the doctor was relying on these statements as true mm -hmm. and as accurate. In terms of whether the judge was going to take this as a, a true statement of Tom said this person tested positive for COVID or not, I think that, that more goes simply to, to the weight of the medical testimony rather than being separate, direct evidence of causation. Okay. Um, and just, can, I, I, I'd like to, and I'll go back and, and look at it again, but did Dr. Smith specifically say that, that Lynn Craig told him that, um, that her husband had had contact with this person and that the person had had um, tested positive for COVID that day. Dr. Smith testified that he relied on Lynn Craig's deposition transcript, and that deposition transcript does contain that statement. Uh, as to whether she told him separately from that, I don't know. And the deposition transcript was not admitted into evidence, or was it admitted? It was not. No. Uh, so Dr. Smith related everything that was in the offer of proof as it relates to why he came to his conclusion. That's right. Everything except, I think, for Lynn's statement after the telephone call on the 19th uh, when Tom learned he was positive and he got off the phone and said, unbelievable, those MFers gave me COVID. That I don't think Dr. Smith heard. I, I, I could be wrong. But again, uh, even that evidence I don't think supports a factual conclusion that, in fact, those people at work did give him COVID. This is just the phone call where Tom learned that he was positive and was upset about it. Um, we've heard a lot about the excited utterance rule here. Uh, first, I think that that argument is waived. It wasn't raised below, and the ALJ didn't consider whether this qualified as an excited utterance. Uh, but even so, the excited utterance rule, I, I don't think applies here. It's meant to bring in statements that are made in the heat of the moment before somebody has an opportunity to um, to develop a narrative about what had happened or to reflect on events. And here Tom, I think, plainly had an opportunity to reflect on what had happened. He had uh, apparently this meeting with like, somebody who was coughing in his office at an unknown date, and he was worried about COVID. He's thinking these things over in his mind, and then these little events crop up along the way. But you, you started off this discussion by saying it doesn't apply. The excited utterance rule does not apply to these proceedings, correct? All we have to determine is whether or not the evidence is inherently reliable. You're right, Your Honor. If, if, and that's a much lesser standard. Correct? That's true. If, if we can just sidestep the whole excited utterance discussion, I'm and happy to do right so. go right to was it inherently reliable, which uh, is a lesser standard, right? Th that's true. It, it is a lesser standard. And in... Workers' compensation proceedings, hearsay is routinely admitted uh, as long as it meets basic indicia of reliability. And administrative law judges will consider that all the time. Uh, but the evidence doesn't just have to be reliable. It also has to be relevant. And it's... Counsel, you're... Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, certainly, though, you wouldn't argue it wouldn't, wasn't relevant. 
Reliable is a separate issue, but relevant. Okay. Well, let's let's talk about reliability. It, it, what do we want to rely on these statements for? Are, are we relying on so, them? So we that, that's fine if we want to talk about reliability, but you're not arguing that it's not relevant, correct? I think that these statements provide a relevant foundation for an expert opinion uh, and might be evidence that could support a doctor's conclusion one way or the other as to causation. But uh, not as to proof of exposure in the em employment context? As proof of, uh, as proof of <coughs> exposure, yes, but not as proof of transmission or causation. So, but isn't proof of exposure relevant in this context, in this case? Well, I think there was plenty of proof of potential sources of exposure offered in this case, both out, at work and elsewhere. Um, it, in Serbia, did we hold that you had to sh exclude all potential sources or just show that there was a potential source within the employment contract? In uh, Zerbi, you held that in certain circumstances, a worker may be able to provide facts of workplace transmission of a disease. And if those facts are established and all the other statutory requirements are met, that infection may be compensable. And it wasn't conclusive. <clears throat> that in, in Zerbi that the employee contracted the disease within the employment context, but it was clearly a potential source. No, in Zerbi, the ALJ did resolve a conflict in the evidence and did decide that the facts pointed to workplace transmission and workplace infection. Here, the judge looked at the facts and made the opposite conclusion based on the evidence presented. So this, my point being is that there was specific evidence that in that case where they may have contracted the disease from someplace else outside of the work. And she, and there, I would think it was she, resolved it in favor of the employee in that case. That is correct. But that goes to my question. It goes to what Judge Thummel was just asking. Isn't it relevant if, if Lynn Craig can say uh, he was aware that someone within the employment, in his employment, had the disease? Isn't that relevant evidence of whether or not he contracted the disease in the course and scope of his appointment? It's relevant insofar as it provides a foundation for a doctor's opinion that this was a more likely source of transmission than anywhere else he would have gone. Again, I think this all comes back to, to whether this testimony, um, how this testimony provides a foundation for the expert's conclusions and doesn't stand on its own. For instance, if no doctors testified and all you had was Lynn Craig saying, I know for a fact that this man was in my husband's office on this date and he tested positive for COVID, that would not be enough to say that for sure this man's visit in his office was enough to give him COVID-19. You're right, but we have the opposite of that. We have doctors talking about whether there was medical exposure, wife wanting to testify, but the ALJ not allowing that. And if... I, I continue to be have a question about whether that could fairly be described as not relevant for a workplace exposure, um, but I think I understand your position. You're arguing is not relevant, but just humor me and let's say I might find it was relevant. Tell me why it's not reliable or is cumulative. <clears throat> well, it's cumulative because the doctors already did use this evidence. It, well, but but there's a difference between, and, and if we revert back to the rules of evidence, and, and I get that they don't apply here, which suggests to me it's more expansive to allow even more evidence in, but there's a difference between what an expert relies on, which I think is governed under 703 of the rules of evidence, and what somebody testifies to based on personal knowledge, mm -hmm. um, and one is what an expert relies on. The expert can testify to that. And if it's not otherwise admissible, it can be if it meets kind of a reverse 403 prejudice standard. But if it's already in the evidence, it's considered by the finder of fact for two reasons, right? One is substantive evidence of however it's offered. And the other is the basis for the expert's testimony. And those seem to me to be quite different things. And that's why I keep, you know, sort of, pressing you on that, on that point. Yeah, and I'm trying to, to, to draw this distinction myself right now. Um, I, I think 
here it's important that the administrative law judge plays the function of both you know, fact finder and, and, and judge in these proceedings. Like a bench trial. Like, yeah, like a bench exactly trial. Exactly right. So it's not as if, well, the, the judge saw the offer of proof and was well aware of what Lynn and Ms. Shepard would have testified to. It's not as if this evidence was, was completely kept away from the fact finder like you might do with a jury. So here the judge was able to look at this evidence and he decided this evidence is not going to move the needle one way or another. Uh, it's, it basically says stuff I've already heard before and it's not dispositive as to the factual issue here. So uh, he, that's, that's at least a strong indication that even if he had considered it, it would not have changed his, his resolution of the medical conflict in this case. Might the better approach have been, at least for purposes of the issues raised in this appeal, for the ALJ to simply receive it and consider it and perhaps come to the same conclusion that you just espoused. We would have no issue here. We would have nothing to talk about here if that <laughs> We have uh, discussed this many times since this appeal was filed. Maybe we should just let that stuff go in. Um, this is what, what can become very tricky uh, in these industrial commission proceedings is we do have our own rules of procedure uh, and evidentiary standards. And the rules of evidence don't exactly apply, but sometimes they can apply. and. And it's always difficult uh, to ask a judge to exclude evidence because there's always the, the worry that they maybe should have admitted it, even if it's not going to make a difference. So I, I do agree that from a practice standpoint, that's always a judgment call, whether you object to certain evidence or not. Uh, but I, I do think fundamentally, right, the, the judge did look at this evidence and knew what it was going to be and was able, in the, the decision upon hearing, to say, I've reviewed the offer of proof, and it wasn't going to make a difference. But it, it, if that's the case, then why do we even have hearings at all? Why couldn't you just do, you know, both sides will just submit their own affidavit, saying this is what, this is what it is, and there's no assessment of credibility and nothing. Because this ALJ, ALJ if he had actually heard from Mrs. Craig, may have come to a different conclusion that what she's testifying about is reliable, versus an offer of proof that was what? It was like a paragraph and the, you know, it, it wasn't much. But it just seems to me that it's not just a matter of he knew, he being the ALG, knew the essence of the testimony. He didn't get to hear the testimony and assess her credibility as it relates to the point she was trying to make. That's true. But it still doesn't change the factual determination as to whether this workplace exposure actually caused Tom to contract COVID. He would have heard that Tom told his wife that this person uh, was, was COVID positive. And he then would have um, heard his wife say that, that Tom exclaimed angrily to her that those people at work gave me COVID. I mean, that, the second statement is... I think obviously insufficient for, for the, the truth of the matter, right? That angry statement on the phone can't actually tell you that those people at work gave him COVID. Uh, that's just his shocked reaction to getting a positive diagnosis. Uh, but even, even the statement that this person that he was talking to that was coughing was COVID positive. Um, again, that, that did make it in as the basis for Smith's opinion. Smith testified as if, uh, it, in fact, this were true, that this person was infected. I, I don't think there was any real dispute that, that Tom was talking with somebody who, who was sick, but nobody knew who this person was. There, there's no documented proof that he was infected. Uh, there, there's just a lot of missing gaps. And that's where, where Dr. Brooks' opinion came in, and just to say that there's simply not enough data here, regardless of, of who you talk to, to say that he was actually infected at work. Um, Council, I'm going to yes. do something very unorthodox. Can we stop the time? We, we, have, we have a group of young friends that have been here to watch argument today, and they've been so respectful and done such a great job here in the courtroom, but I think they have to leave, and rather than it disrupting your argument, I thought we'd take a quick time out, because I think the group needs to leave. Is that correct? Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.
jury leave. <laughs> That's right. Oh, we didn't get a vote. <laughs> Thank you for that, Council. Okay, we'll go ahead and start back up. So, can I can I paraphrase what I believe your argument? Just to make sure I'm clear. So, what you're saying is, yeah, it may have been air, but it would not have made a difference to Dr. Brooks because he assumed everything. What the offer of proof was is what Lynn would have testified to. And he was just discrediting it. That, that, is, that is close. I don't even know that he was discrediting it. Dr. Brooks testified that uh, even if there was a known exposure at work, this is a quote from his testimony, even if there was a known exposure at work, meaning a coworker or a vendor came in, spent time in or around Mr. Craig, including in his office, unless it was some extraordinary exposure, even if that person tested positive for COVID, I still could not tell you that it's more likely than not that he got infected at work based on these other much more probable scenarios. Uh, so is that based on chronology or just people at work don't pass disease? That's, that's based on chronology. Um, Brooks also provided testimony about how these diseases are, are transmitted, but I think his opinion largely came down to chronology, along with Tom's, or the other history provided about Tom's potential sources of exposure outside of work. He ate out at restaurants twice a week with his wife. He went grocery shopping with her. He had three adult children who all worked in very public-facing jobs to say nothing of this two-day financial seminar, where they were in a room with between 30 to 100 people, depending on when Lynn is testifying. She really reduced her estimate between deposition and hearing. For two days, for seven hours, where there was no proof of vaccination required, and five days after that seminar, Tom got sick, the friend that invited them there got sick, his wife got sick, and Brooks looked at this timeline and said, this is much more a much more likely scenario, particularly given that there was no documented, there were no documented symptoms before July 19th, aside from the wife's subsequent testimony. The timeline that she submitted into evidence before the hearings did not describe any symptoms before the 19th. None of Tom's coworkers described any symptoms before the 19th. The medical records don't support any symptomatology before about the, the 19th. Um, certainly I was nothing. about to ask you, I, I thought the medical records indicated that he started with symptomology around the 19th. Is that correct? That's correct. I don't know that they gave that date, but he was hospitalized on the 25th, and then it says that he had symptoms for about a week before. The 19th is six days before, so I think that's pretty close. So again, even if this evidence had been admitted, uh, even if it was error to exclude it, it's not an error that would have changed the, the outcome here in terms of weighing the medical evidence. Dr. Brooks has already taken in to account that, that hey, even assuming this, this unknown person was COVID positive, you know, even if we knew his name, even if we could say, yes, uh, you know, Mr. Rodriguez was in my office on July 5th and he was coughing and he told me the next day that he was COVID positive and gosh, I tested positive, you know, two weeks later, it must have been him. Well, that's not enough to say that, in fact, that person whose name we now know and uh, that, that would not be enough to say that that's how you got it, given all these other sources of exposure. Uh, so in that case, the, the evidence in favor of Dr. Brooks's opinions was reasonable and substantial and the judge, um, properly exercised her discretion to resolve that conflict in his favor. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Abney, a little over three minutes, if you'd like it. It's an ocean of time, Your Honor. Uh, uh, without being blasphemous, I've, I've often thought that a judge at a bench trial is three in one. Not Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but uh, <laughs> there is a person that looks at everything, hears everything, there's a person who makes rulings on evidence, and then there's a person that only considers the evidence that the second person has allowed in, into, into the record. And here we have an ALJ that is, that is uh, denied to himself, as, as the second judge, has denied to himself evidence that's crucially important on the, on the possibility of exposure and when it happened and how it happened and where it happened. And that was a mistake. That, that kept evidence from judge number three, the one that's supposed to be ruling on these sorts of things. I listened with some amusement to the, to the statement that hearsay is routinely admitted at administrative hearings, not because it's wrong, that's right, 
But that's not what happened here. There were hearsay objections coming out the ears when, when they were trying to get an evidence about the secretary and the wife and, and what Tom had said. Objection after objection, eventually that was all shut down. Uh, and of course, at the end, you get the rejection of the offer of proof. Uh, the answering brief is actually very helpful on, on a couple of points. Uh, uh, you're right, Dr. Brooks said uh, that he thought it was more likely that it was exposure at the seminar, the 15th or 16th of July. But then on page 12 of the answering brief, at the first paragraph, it says, although Dr. Brooks thought Tom was likely exposed around the time of the seminar, he testified that there is no way anybody from a scientific standpoint can tell anybody where Tom got COVID from. He can't, he can't say. He says nobody from a scientific standpoint perspective can say, but we've got, we've got, uh, I don't know where I put it. We've got uh, a series of factors from Dr. Smith where he goes over and explains very carefully in a scientific way why he believes that the exposure uh, had taken place more along the timeline that the wife had suggested. Uh, and as you, the, Brooks is really basing his opinion on the medical records when Tom was admitted to the hospital. The medical history records were taken down, and they're a bit fuzzy. You know, if, you, if you count back seven days, a week or so, a week or so from the 25th, you wind up on the 18th, not the 19th, and maybe why not the 17th, or even earlier than that. Uh, plus, you have the unusual history of Tom, uh, who was fighting off his, this disease at home, according to his wife, for a, a period of time. Uh, without getting tested for it, and then eventually he gets tested and has the unpleasant realization that things are bad, he quarantines, he goes to the hospital, he's released, goes back home, goes to the hospital, goes back home, and then goes to the hospital again and stays there until he dies. So an unusually resilient, persistent, obstinate man uh, who tried to, to put this in the rearview mirror before it was really belonged there. I think that's part of what happened to him. They didn't get proper, consistent treatment. But in any event, uh, I submit to you that there is enough evidence here that the ALJ should not have ruled as the ALJ did, and uh, by purposely blinding himself to the excited utterance of Evans, and by saying that that I'm, I'm picking one of these two opinions when they're really, really not conflicting fully, uh, that that was a mistake. Thank, Thank you, you for your patience Thank and for your time. Thank you both for your uh, briefs and for your argument today. We'll take the matter under advisement, issue a written ruling in due course, and we are adjourned.